welcome to another session of the Cigars and Sparlor. And I thank all who are connected here on Zoom. And uh, as you know, the Cigars and Sparlor is the place where we like to gather with those cigar lovers who want more education. And of course, through education, we increase our cigar pleasure. We all know that, and this is all Cigar Sense exists for. We have to find the cigars that you will like based on your unique preferences. And there's even a free membership. So if you haven't done it yet, please check that out. Uh, today, our guest is Valerie Bradshaw. Some of you know her already. She is very, very well known in the community. Uh, she's a great panelist, as we call uh, that also analyst at Cigar Sense. She is also a super credentialed wine and spirits professional who trained many people in sensory appreciation workshops in both the US and her home country, Canada. She's a great communicator, you, you will hear her, and she loves to focus on the aromatic universe with objective vocabulary and descriptors. Valerie is, uh, like me, a member of the Society of Sensory Professionals and has certificates from different olfactory programs. Last but not least, she is a proud Cigar Rights of America lifetime member, ambassador, and advocate. Today, Valerie will talk about rum, the different styles and sensory characteristics of rum. As in the past, you know, please ask your questions directly here on Zoom. And uh, if we manage to go live on Facebook, I will also check there uh, for any questions on that. And Valerie, thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Franca. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Today, we're going to talk about rum. Um, and, you know, I want, to, I want to preface it by saying, uh, I want to quote Dave Broom, who has written a lot of books on whiskey and knows rum, and he's done a book on gin. But it's like Dave Broom says, there's no such thing as a rum but there's a whole bunch of different kinds of rum. And since production is spread out through so many areas, each has its own unique style. And by style, I mean, it, it will present itself differently. And we're going to discuss a little bit about that today. Now, when we're talking about tasting any liquid, I always like to mention that you, you want to pour your beverage into a glass like a Glencairn, you only want to fill it to the widest part of the bowl, but this Glencairn glass has a wide bowl. It allows the aromas to, you know, come closer together and then open up a little bit at the rim. And the other nice thing about a Glencairn, it's got a very thin rim. These are made to very specific standards so that every time, you know, you place it on your lips, you're always getting the same sensation because sometimes a sensation can influence your taste, whether it's a cigar or a liquid. Anybody have any questions about that? I'll move along. There's other glasses that you can use. Riedel rhymes with needle, so it's the correct pronunciation. Riedel makes a nice little whiskey glass as well. I've got a few of these. But if you just want to go to a dollar store, I picked this one up from a dollar store. And, and it meets all the criteria for a good tasting glass. And I think I paid maybe $4 for this one. I like it because I can hold it by the base. This way you're not warming up the liquid at all because that'll make a difference too. You want the liquid to be at room temperature as best you can. So that's the first little educator on glassware. Um, when it comes to cigars, I, I want to show off something that I received as a gift. This is what I use to cut my cigar. I've got the, the Villiger. It's um, um, a nice, um, you know, small ring gauge cigar. But this is a Dunhill cutter that, you know, when you pull it apart, you can cut your cigar with it. And I just think this is the handiest little thing in the world. Um, another thing that you should think about when you're smoking your cigar is have a cigar rest. I've got this one from Cigar Prop. It's easy to manipulate. You can also get a wider one. I also got this one from Cigar Prop. And 
to go with my Dunhill cutter, I've also got a little Dunhill um, cigar rest. This one's got quite a bit of weight. Uh, makes a great gift if you can still find them. So let's get on. Oh, I also want to mention you can either buy Glencairn glasses by the single or you can buy them in a box, a box of six. So if you, you know, if you're somebody who is very social, you like to, you know, drink your rum or your whiskeys with friends, maybe look at spending, I think they're about $55 for a box of six in most markets, but don't quote me on that. So moving along, we're here to talk about rum and rum can either be light, it can be uh, a golden color, it can be dark. The way rum flavors come across is the manner in which it's distilled. Sometimes it's in a pot still, sometimes it's in a column still, sometimes most often it's made from molasses, but there are some that are made from pure cane juice and we'll talk about those in a little while. Rum used to be a byproduct of sugar because back in the 1800s, sugar was um, uh, a, a, a real commodity and rum used to be the byproduct. But now rum has become such a premium spirit that sugar is kind of the byproduct in the Caribbean of rum production. Um, it's not easy to understand rum because there are so many countries producing it and they, they, they all have their own kinds of rules. And we'll get into rules a little bit later. Um, but it, it all comes down to if you've got sugar cane, chances are you've got rum because it, they just go hand in hand. So like I say, rum is made, uh, was typically made from um, the molasses. When, when you cut down sugar cane, you crush it and you, through the process, the sugar crystals are, are extracted and the molasses, the goopy molasses is left. And it's the molasses that, uh, that, that rum typically is made from. And I'm not, I'm not going to say always because like I say, rum, rum varies from region to region. Um, the British found back in, you know, the 1800s, they found that they really enjoyed rum more than spirits in their in you know in their own area because rum to be transported from the caribbean had to spend quite a bit of time in cask to get to you know britain or france uh to those populations and so that gave the rum a chance to settle down a little bit it wasn't as harsh it, it rounded out the edges that that um sea trip um ocean trip canada played a big role in rum um, for a variety of reasons. And uh, for, for quite a while, Canada was a country that, that did keep rum production afloat. And again, we'll get into that in a little while. You could also say that rum is North America's first spirit because it was distilled along the East Coast, along many areas on the East Coast. But the Caribbean islands that dominated sugar and therefore rum production were Barbados, Jamaica, Haiti, and Cuba. And it was in Santiago, Cuba, that it, rum became industrialized and modernized by the Bacardi family. And this goes back to 1860, 1862. What people liked about the Bacardi rum, it was very light, it was fragrant, it was very easy to drink. And um, it, it mixed well, it could be a sipper, it could be a mixer. So it it fell into a lot of drinking style categories. Now, there have been a lot of changes in the rum industry, but one of the biggest boosts that rum got was the result of prohibition. Prohibition took place in around the 20s, you know, in that range of time. And so Americans weren't able to get any uh, liquor legally, uh, you know, there are stories about the Canadian producers of spirits and, and how that kind of helped the Americans a little bit. But Cuba also opened up their doors and they actually advertised, come to Cuba where you can drink rum, you know, frolic on the beaches and just have a great time. And the Americans responded. Cuba became just a, a real destination for a lot of American tourists because they really did want to have, you know, a spirit to drink, they wanted to have fun, a few laughs, and so Prohibition really did help rum, just like Prohibition and World War I really helped Canadian whiskey. Um, so when, when you think about 
what kind of spirit becomes popular when there's not just, you know, one activity at play. It's usually the culmination of a whole bunch of different things. And like I say, for the, for the uh, Cubans, it was prohibition and it's you know, Cuba's proximity to the states. Now, um, in the late 1800s, the Americans helped liberate Cuba from Spain. And uh, this led to the creation of one of the most famous um, cocktails, eyeballs, um, ever created. Um, there was a, a, a sailor who decided to add a little bit of a new uh, beverage called Coca-Cola to the rum. And it was named a Cuba Libre, Liberate Cuba, Free Cuba. And um, today, uh, who, who hasn't heard of a, of a Cuba Libre, right? And it's very easy, easy to make. Um, you basically, you know, you take your glass, you take your rum, pour it in, add a little bit. Oh, you know what? I did that backwards. You should actually add ice first because there's some purists who believe that if you add ice after you add the spirit, then you're bruising the alcohol, you're bruising the spirit, which I find, I find kind of funny, but if that's what they want to believe, then let them believe that. Um, you add your little bit of Coca-Cola, mix it in there, and then of course, you add a little bit of lime, and it's got to have some lime for sure. Now the thing is, a Cuba Libra is a very refreshing drink, but I caution against using a drink like that with a cigar pairing if you're doing the, the cigar for an assessment, because I can smell that lime and that lime will always be in your brain as you're smoking your cigar. You don't smell the Coke so much, but you definitely sm smell the lime. So it's very refreshing, use it as a social beverage, but I don't recommend using it if you're actually trying to do an assessment or, or a technical kind of pairing of a beverage with um, with a cigar. So, uh, any questions before I go on? I was just seeing Edson <laughs> laughing <laughs> as you were explaining about the Cuba Libre. Edson, would you like to add something? <laughs> okay, you're fine. All right. Okay. So, in terms of production, the most important thing to remember, like tobacco, um, rum is an agricultural, um, sugarcane is an agricultural product, and it can be affected by any number of things uh, during the course of the, of the harvest and, and the growing season. So, you know, the cane variety plays a role, soil that it's growing in plays a role, uh, climate, weather, all of these things can make a difference. You know, when you ask a, a, a cigar maker, um, a, tobac a, a tobacco farmer, you know, to, to bring it down to its simplest, not simplest terms, but its basic terms, the thing that keeps them up at night is weather. Uh, weather can, can, can bring all kinds of problems. You know, there, there can be drought, there can be too much rain, there can be hurricanes. Um, hurricanes, for instance, were responsible for uh, uh, spreading um, the blue mold, that sort of thing. It, it, it's, it's shocking what weather can do. Um, so it's important to always kind of, you know, be generous in our thoughts when it comes to any kind of agri agricultural product, because there are certain things that are out of, a, that are out of the producer's control and weather is, 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 you know, the biggest one by far. Um, so all of these things influence um, uh, cane production, sugar cane production. Some countries have, have a chance to recover, like for instance, Guyana, South America countries, South American countries, they can have two crops per year. So they can lose one crop due to weather and then they can recover with a second crop. Not everybody has that backup, that plan B. Um, parts of the Caribbean, they can harvest all year round. Um, and again, they're not as affected by um, the weather conditions as, as, you know, producers of other agricultural crops. Um, but when it comes to actually working with the sugar cane, um, cane is either mechanically harvested or it could be cut by hand, which is much more labor intensive. If you do find a rum that uh, is, you know, harvested by hand, I think you can expect to pay a little bit more because labor costs. Mechanical is, is a much, you know, cheaper way to go. 
but labor always has additional costs attached to it. The other thing with sugarcane is when it's cut, it has to make it to the mill as soon as possible because as soon as it's cut, the sucrose levels start to go down. And, and there's, there's a lot of uh, products in the world that are affected by timing. For instance, Chanel number no. five, they use the Rose de May. They have to harvest it basically before sunrise because that Rose de May is very delicate and they've got to get it to the perfume factory to extract the essential oils. Same thing with sugarcane. You've got to get it to the mill quickly. And so uh, speed is of the essence when it comes to rum production. So uh, the process for sugarcane is um, you cut it from the field, you take it to the mill where it's crushed, the juice is extracted, the syrup is procured, and that syrup is boiled until crystals are formed. And then what is left, the thick black residue that's left after the sugar crystals are removed, is the stuff known as molasses. And this is the raw material that um, rum is made from. On average, 2.5 uh, kilograms of molasses will give you one liter of rum at about 57 alcohol by volume, ABV. So really, you know, you, you do need quite a bit to get that kind of yield when it comes to bottles of, of rum. So fermentation, molasses, they're very, very high in sugars. Yeast can't live in, there's got to be a, a yeast is, is a kind of a delicate thing. There's got to be a certain um, a cohesion, a certain balance. So before they ferment, they dilute the molasses with water. And the more the molasses are diluted, the lighter the rum, believe it or not. That's one of the things that uh, as, as you study rum, uh, you learn. Now, the thing too is, I'd like to mention at this point, the education that I have is through Wine and Spirit Education Trust, uh, WSET. It's considered the gold standard in wine and spirit education. And I'm very proud to always wear my WSET pin right with my Cigar Rights of America pin. And thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you, Franca, uh, for mentioning Cigar Rights of America. It's really important that um, cigar smokers join Cigar Rights of America, they're a lobbying group. They've had some, you know, they, they and the um, Premium Cigar Association have had some great successes in the last little while. Um, things that are facing legislation concerning cigars. So, you know, CRA, join Cigar Rights of America, but also vote. You've got to, um, you know, I can't say you've got to. You can't tell anybody what to do. But I highly recommend that you, that you pay attention to what's going on in your local uh, your state and your federal governments, because they have a lot of anti-tobacconists at the table lobbying. And we as cigar smokers have to also consider stepping up. Um, otherwise, we will lose some of our cigar smoking rights. And that includes lounges, because the anti-tobacconists, they, they want to see tobacco-free generation. So they don't want people to have a, a comfortable place to smoke their cigars. And in Canada, for instance, We've also got plain packaging. So this is the kind of tube that if you don't fight for the rights of cigars, this is the kind of tube your premium cigars will show up in if it's got a tube. If it doesn't have a tube, it's gonna have a label in those same colors, not good. And that's what we're faced with in Canada. We've got plain packaging here and we're not that, you know, we're just across the border from the United States. Let's hope it doesn't happen there. Thank okay. you for mentioning this, uh, Valerie. And I, uh, um, I would like to add, actually, help educate your politicians, because there's a lot of scientific evidence that we can use to keep, uh, you know, uh, ongoing the effort of educating politicians to understand what premium cigars are and why they're different from any, any other tobacco products. So absolutely <laughs> close the parentheses <laughs> full circle. Yeah. Cigars are meditation. And uh, we all know that that's true. They're, they're good for our health. So back to rum. We talked about molasses being diluted with water. Yeast is then added. And um, there are rum producers, just like there's bourbon producers, who have their own strains of yeast. They have found the yeast that's right. Very few places use indigenous yeast because indigenous yeast is kind of a wild yeast. 
So you never know what's going to happen with that yeast. Whereas if you use your own strain of yeast that you know, you've, you've carried on for decades, it's very predictable. You know what's going to happen when the yeast hits whatever you want it to feed on. So um, uh, yeast is a fascinating topic because yeast can, can do a lot of things. It can add aromas. It, it just can do a lot of things, but that's a topic for a, a, you know, another time. Okay, so light rums are distilled in column stills, a single column, a coffee still, or a continuous still. Um, larger producers use multiple linked column stills. They've got to pump out a lot of rum. People, people love rum and, and it's a big export for these countries. Um, one of the ways to get a rich style rum is by using a pot still instead of a column still. Um, you, you, get, you get a rum that's got more body. Again, this is a topic that's more for another session because it's, it's quite involved. But familiarize yourself with column stills and pot stills. Learn a little bit about that. It's, it's helpful. Um, no matter what process they use for distillation, they may have to typically mature the rum. White rums often aren't aged in anything. Um, they just kind of go straight to, to, they don't spend any time in wood. But some producers do put their, um, their distillate into oak. It gives it a little bit of a different composition. And for instance, Bacardi will have, even its white rum, uh, spend a little bit of time in oak, and then they filter out the color. So it, it comes out as a white rum. Um, because anytime you've got a liquid in oak, oak has color and it's going to add that. It's also got char, so that's going to add a little bit to the spirit. Um, me. May I? Um, so I know of uh, a white rum, light rum, that is actually aged in uh, white oak casks. Are there many? I only know one, but are there many that do that rather than filtering out the color? You know, it depends on your market. And when that happens, sometimes they, they, they don't make it to all, all the countries that uh, receive exports on rum. But yeah, there, there are different uh, producers who choose different styles of aging for their rum, different times, different wood. Um, uh, American oak is different than French oak, for instance. Some use French, some use American. Um, and you know, while we're on American oak, let's, let's talk about this. Um, when you put any liquid in a barrel, there's gonna be an exchange of oxygen. That's, that's what aging is. You, you can't just put an, um, an, an oak stave into a bottle, put the cap on into a glass bottle, put a cap on, seal it that way. Nothing is going to happen to that bottle. It's got to be in a cask so there's an exchange of oxygen. That's the key to aging. The downside to that exchange of oxygen is angel share. There, you know, the wood is porous and there's going to be some evaporation. This reduces the overall yield for the rum producer. For instance, distillers, uh, Caribbean distillers typically lose about 6% per year um, to angel share through evaporation of their liquid. It's hot, it's humid, so you know, things, as it gets hotter, let's face it, when we get hot, what happens? We sweat, right? Same thing with the cask. When it gets hot, it kind of sweats. Um, so 6% per year. Now, to put that into perspective, in Scotland, because it's got cool, damp weather, it might lose 6% every three years instead of every one year. So Caribbean distillers, they, they go to different tactics to try to um, reduce that evaporation. When I was in Nicaragua, for instance, I visited the Florida Canya um, facility, and they use uh, plantain leaves. They wrap their casks in plantain leaves because that helps keep things um, in the barrel a little bit longer. Um, not by much, but enough to make a difference. It's very, very hard for a rum producer to get to 25 years. It's not quite so hard for a whiskey producer to get to 15, 25 years um, 
you know, time spent in wood, but it's very, very hard for a rum producer. And um, so if you can, if you can find one, yay, because they've had a lot of time, things have really mellowed out and you're going to get more of the um, oak influence, you know, like baking spices. That's the result of uh, uh, like cinnamon, nutmeg. Those, those are the result of time spent in wood if you get those aromas on your rum. And we're good so far? I, I should also mention. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's stick to the to the to the cask issue a little bit, because part of the reason um, most distillers use American bourbon casks, uh, ex bourbon American oak ex bourbon casks, is a law that was introduced many many years ago. Bourbon producers are only able to use their cask once. They're, you know, they, they have to keep it for three years or they could keep it for five, 10 or 15, whatever. But typically because of production and yield and they wanna get the product to the market, once they've pulled their liquid out of that cask, they have to dismantle it and send it away because if they want to start an, another run, they have to start with new casks. So that means that rum producers, just like you know, Scotch whiskey producers, Canadian whiskey producers, there is an abundance of American oak barrels available to them at considerably less money. And I'm quoting from a few years ago, but it was my understanding that an American oak bourbon, ex-bourbon cask um, runs about $250 per cask, whereas a French barrique, which is smaller, you're looking at like 1,200 euro. So, uh, and you know, those prices might have changed. This is, you know, information that I received a few years ago, but there is a significant difference between American oak casks and a French barrique in terms of cost. Yeah. Okay, so um, we've talked about casks, we've talked about, you know, cane. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about developing the, the aromas and the flavors. So, you're going to get an influence from the oak into the rum, depending on how long the, the distillate spends in oak, how often that cask has been used. You can always say that you're using, you know, an American oak barrel, but you can use that barrel several, several, several times before you actually, you know, before it runs out of its life, before it hits its life cycle and you can't use it anymore. Some places, use them for in for eternity but they can still say that it's been matured or aged in in an oak cask so this is where education comes in handy so that you, people can learn a little bit um about you know the the life cycle of a of a cask but most places most distillers bourbon distillers most whiskey distillers use um bourbon casks, and I should mention at this point that September's an interesting month because it's actually Bourbon Heritage Month. And uh, this is the month that, you know, the producers in Kentucky, they, they really do a lot to um, educate people about bourbon and, and, and the, ex the extent to which bourbon impacts the entire world of spirits. So, um, we're going to get to talking about the different um, rums. I'd also like to mention there are different ways to find rum in the market. For instance, we're all very familiar with the bourbons that are on, or sorry, with the rums that are on the shelf. But you'll also get companies like A.D. Rattray. They will um, find a producer of rum and they'll do their own bottling. For instance, this is from a store in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada called Wine and Beyond, and they decided that they wanted their own bottle of rum. So um, A.D. Rattray managed to uh, source a rum producer who was prepared to bottle that for that particular store. So outside of your typical commercial, uh, commercially produced rums, you can get rum that, that has been, that's a special bottling. Um, and just if people aren't familiar with A.D. Rattray, they, they're um, an independent bottler that, you know, seeks out uh, different companies to do special bottlings. And like, for instance, I got this 42-year-old Tam Dew. This is a whiskey, but 
but this just speaks to how much effort a company like ED Rattray puts into sourcing places to do special bottlings. So moving along, um, back to Cuba. Cuba created basically Bacardi until they had to move out of Cuba like like everybody else, let's face it, everybody, no, nobody's surprised to hear, and, it, and it's a shame that a lot of these companies had. That company managed to do a style of rum that was very well received, and it's kind of considered the Latin America style of rum. It's very light, uh, it's very easy to drink, and a lot of the uh, Caribbean countries, islands, followed that style of rum. For instance, Nicaragua, their Florida Canya, they've gotten the Latin American style of rum. Uh, Dominican Republic has the Brugal. Uh, Guatemala does Zacapa. Uh, even US Virgin Islands with their Cruzan. So this is where we're going to start looking at the different rums from the different producers. So Bacardi, they do so many different rums, but I was able to find this one in our market and it's the Limitada. Um, this one runs you 130, 150 maybe in my market, but this should be a very nice sipping rum. A lot of rums are made uh, for mixing, but if you're looking for a sipping rum, try to, you know, seek this one out. It will be the light style. And um, you can usually count on Bacardi to come up with a pretty good expression of rum. So, I kind of give them credit because they opened the door for so many of the other rum producers. Uh, that is their symbol, and that comes from um, Mrs. Bacardi, who uh, felt that the bats there also, they found these bats in, in, in abundance. She thought that it was good luck, it was thought as good luck, and so that's why you see the, the bat on every bottle of uh, Bacardi. So Florida Kenya is another one. I'm very proud to say that I've got the Florida Kenya 25. Um, as I mentioned, to get to 25 years for rum is just a really big deal. It doesn't happen very often, reasonably priced. This Florida Kenya 25, um, I think I got that a year ago, and it was about $225, because I know people like to talk about price. Um, Florida Kenya does a lot of things that are that are good for the world, not just good for Nicaragua and for the people of Nicaragua, but for good for good for the world. Um, Florida Kenya is Spanish for sugarcane flour. The company dates back to the 1890s. It's won all kinds of awards, uh, and they are a they, they're a responsible distiller, like they're always looking for the right way to put their product to market. Um, with Florida Kenya, you've got several years that you can choose from. You know, there's a five, the seven, a 12, a 15, the 25, I think, if I'm not mistaken, those are the right years. Um, it's, it's definitely a rum that's worth adding to your rum collection because it's it's just well done and Florida Canyon does does good things environmentally and as a good corporate citizen. Um, we can go into the Dominican Republic. Now when it comes to Dominican Republic, I don't have that many options to choose from in my market, but I will say this, when it comes to pairing a cigar and a rum, it's it's like wine. Pick a cigar from that region. You know, from Dominican Republic, you can go to a, a GTO cigar, which I'm very, very fond of. Um, I like Casa Cueva cigars, they're very good. The, the Brugal, the only Dominican rum that I can find in my market is this one. It's more of a mixer, but you know what? They do all kinds of extra fun stuff. You can get a pair of sunglasses with it. So it depends on where you stand, right? <laughs> it depends on what you want. Um, and when it comes to making, you know, a judgment call on anything, you have to, not again, you don't have to, but I recommend that you gauge a rum or a cigar on its own merits. If, if the rum is meant to, to be a sipper, then gauge it as a sipper. But if it's meant to be a mixer, appreciate that as well. Um, Trinidad, they're known more for bitters, but they also produce rum. 
and it typically is spicy. It's got notes of guava, a little bit of vanilla, but um, Trinidad, we all know how big bitters have become, and it's a story that, that basically started that all off. Um, Barbados, best known, I think, for Mount Gay, if I'm not mistaken, and Mount Gay rum is typically considered to be the oldest known rum in the world because they were the ones who kept the best notes. Um, there there might have been other producers, but Mount Gay was the one that kept notes. So we can prove it. They can prove their claims, right? Um, the thing about um, Barbados is Malibu rum likely has Barbados rum in it. And the thing about Malibu rum is rum is great for mixing. It, it, it's nice for sipping. Thing, but it's amazing for mixing. You can do so many things with it and it automatically kind of puts you into that Caribbean spirit. You, you right away start thinking pineapple and coconut and, and everything that you know goes with being on the beach. Um, now Malibu rum here is distributed by Hiram uh, Walker and like I say Barbados makes a lot of bulk rum. You probably will find it in a bottle of Malibu. Somebody recommended that I try, I don't even know how to say this one, it's bamboo, something like that. Um, I, I think I'm saying it right. They really have an interesting website. These guys are salespeople. They know how to sell, let me tell you. This one in my market is $60. And they talk about it being the world's most decorated rum. Now what that means is that one, five gold medals in two years from the Los Angeles International Spirits Competition. So yes, it has a lot of medals, but you really, you know, this is marketing and you have to read between the lines with some of this stuff. And it, and it just kind of makes me laugh. This one, I really started to investigate it. You know, they, they followed the, the total pirate thing with X marks the spot, you know, that's where, this is where the treasure is. The treasure is right underneath the X. They incorporated incorporated it into the label but when you when you read this label this is 35 percent alcohol this is very very low alcohol and you know sometimes i think to myself well it would it would be easy to sip because you don't have that alcohol burn so always keep that in mind always be looking for what is the alcohol content of the rums that you're drinking um guiana for instance i don't have a bottle of it el dorado comes from guiana um, it, El Dorado is a very, very nice sipping rum. Uh, it's worth the money and, and it's really, it's really not even that expensive a rum. But the other thing that comes from Guiana is the 151 rum by Lemon Heart. This is an overproof rum. Whenever you see 151, that's the proof. So you divide it in half and that's the alcohol content. So this guy's at 75.5% alcohol. This has a lot of kick to it, I know. It, it, they, they found a way to make it good. I think this has been removed from a few markets, I'm not sure, I can't get it in my market anymore, so I'm hanging on to this bottle. But this is where the Caribou Lou came from. I made a Caribou Lou cocktail, so you've got the, the um, Lemon Heart 151 rum with some Malibu and some pineapple juice. And I gotta tell you, my daughter Charlie and her and her friend Miles made me my first caribou loo a year ago. And it's dangerous. They are so good. And it just, it really, really tones down once you, you know, that alcohol from, you know, 75% alcohol, it really tones it down. Again, I wouldn't recommend this. Um, necessarily for assessment but it would be a great cocktail to smoke with a cigar as or uh, to drink with it while you smoke a cigar because it's very refreshing it's it's almost a palate cleanser and you'd be surprised how toned down the alcohol is any questions before i go on uh yes <clears throat> So you mentioned um, that there are rums uh, that are not made of molasses, but rather of uh, sugar cane, uh, cane sugar juice. Um, what, uh, what are the main sensory differences between the two styles of rum? Is it just burnt sugar that is less 
you know, you can sense it less in the, in the agricole versus the molasses based rum, or is there anything else? The biggest thing, and I've got, I've got one of those. I've got a, um, a rum from Guadeloupe. All right, so this is the Vieux Rum, okay? Um, rum agricole is, is the French term for sugarcane juice rum. Um, and it's, 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 the way it makes it different is the aromas are different. You're going to get more earthiness from, from you know, a rum like this. But when I tasted this, the most shocking thing to me was how oily it was. There is a distinct sense of oil on my palate. It didn't coat it, but it was there. And you might get, mm, I, I can't call it diesel exactly, but when you get that oiliness, there's, there's something very different about it. And I didn't dislike it. I just found it very, very interesting. And it will really wake you up. If you ever have a chance to try one of these, it will wake you up. Now, the way this rum came into being was um, countries like Guadeloupe, they used to make rum from molasses. But then the French, um, when was this? In the early 20th century, I think it was, the French decided that they would rather get their sugar from um, the less expensive European sugar beets. So there was a lot of sugar producers on those islands that all of a sudden their, their main export market completely dried up. So what were they going to do? They didn't need molasses anymore. They weren't producing sugar. And that's what forced them to come up with um, a bottling of rum agricole. Um, otherwise they would, have, they would have gone completely out of business. But you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Another interesting thing to note about a rum that has French history, French background. The French are known for make, trying to make sure that rules are followed. And they have something that's called um, AOC. It's the App Appalachian Origin Controle. I can't say it in the French way because I don't speak French, but um, you, you can see, I don't know if you can read this, but it does say Appalachian d'Origine. So if I said that right. Um, You're great. What that, yeah, I'm trying, I don't speak French. A, a lot of people think all Canadians speak French, we don't. Um, so what that means is they follow some very strict rules and very strict laws about their harvesting, their yields, the time spent in oak, the type of oak that's used. Um, really, when, when you're thinking about a quality rum, Florida Canyon is a quality rum because of its dedication to the environment and to its community. And a rum like this is also a quality rum that you can kind of count on because they are expected by law to follow very specific rules. It doesn't mean that you're going to like the taste, right? It, that's not, that's not um, the purpose of laws, whether it's wines or spirits, it's not the purpose of laws. The purpose of laws is to make sure nobody breaks the rules. Um, and this all started way back, I think 14th century, I think it was, when um, the Pope had to move to Avignon um, and really liked wine from the Rhone, Chateau Neuf de Pape, that's, you know, new house of the Pope, all of a sudden back in the 14th century, wine producers were, were putting out wine that was called CDP, Chateau Neuf de Pape, when in fact it wasn't, it wasn't Rhone grapes, it, it wasn't anything like it was supposed to be, and so that's when they realized, okay, we've got to incorporate some laws, otherwise we're going to, we're going to have, you know, fraudulent products on the market. Now, I, I do want to mention how much work it takes to qualify for an AOC status. Um, there are certain products all around the world that have AOC status, you know, follow the rules. Uh, in Canada, 
last I heard, there might, it might have changed uh, a few years ago, was Charlevoix lamb. In Quebec, they make a, they, they, um, uh, there are herds of a particular type of lamb that is very, very delicate and very, very delicious. And so when people see Char uh, Charlevoix lamb listed on a menu, they perk up because they know a certain amount of care has been taken in, in those herds. Um, Charlevoix lamb had to go basically into battle to protect its name because there's a lot of fraudulent Charlevoix lambs out there. It took them 10 years, a decade, to get uh, a, a, the equivalent of an AOC status to protect the name Charlevoix for their lamb. So any questions on that? I know we covered a lot. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the appellation uh, pers uh, <laughs> because um, I I have the feeling that other than the, the the rums produced in the French territories, there's not so much certification of this product. Would, am I correct? You're right. You're a hundred percent right. When it comes to rum, there's very few laws. You you can basically do whatever you want. Um, you can never look at a at a rum that's um a dark color and assume that it spent time in oak that's typically what we think when we see a dark color we think oh you know this must have been aged in oak no they can use caramel coloring and 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 there's nothing to prevent them from doing that so you have to be very careful when you look at rums um that mm, color isn't always an indicator of anything it, it could be you know e150a is uh, is the caramel coloring that most people use? It's it's used to color Coca Cola, and to my knowledge, there's only one country in the world that requires a spirit to list that it uses A one fifty A on the label, and that's Germany. Germany expects it to be listed. Anybody else, they can they can do whatever you want. That's why often you'll see spirits in a dark bottle because they people people like the idea of dark. Right, they they think it's it's going to give them something more. Um, you know, I I bought this a few years ago. This is ah, <laughs> this is Rum's Revenge. Uh, again, it's about a two hundred and fifty dollar box, but it gives you you know twelve different rums to try. And which one was it? There was one that was seventeen years. Oh, I can't find it now. Darn it! Like this is a nineteen. Uh, a 19 year old rum, it's not that dark for 19 years. And there was another one, an AD Rattray. Where did I put that one? 17 years. Here it is. This is a Trinidad rum, 17 years, and it's as clear as can be, you know, for rum, right? That, that has seen 17 years. So, you know, color, it, it can be, it can be influenced by time spent in oak. Helpful? Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, so I always ask myself, so there is also this belief that light rums are for easy drinking. They are normally used in cocktails versus darker rums are for, you call it sipping, right? <laughs> um, and um, I got that messed up, actually, that belief messed up when I tried uh, and there may be other products of that type, but the one I tried is a Cuban one of Cuba, Carta Blanca Extra Viejo. And that was a fantastic rum. I would never put it in a cocktail. No. No. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's very light color. And, and it is yes. aged in, as we were saying before, in uh, light uh, white uh, oak uh, casks. And it's, they say it's pretty old. Um, I didn't visit, so I don't know more than, uh, than you know, the experience I had when I was drinking it, that was fantastic. Yes, um, yes, Some, uh, and I agree with you, you know, that 17 year old uh, Trinidad um, by independent bottler A.D. Atre, that's a perfect example of how light uh, a rum can be, even though it spent, a, according to the label, 17 years in oak. Um, now, what they, what they also might do, they might want to take the color out, so they might filter it. I don't know why they'd want to take the color out. Um, sometimes they have to filter to get rid of little wood chips, people, or if it's got a murky color. People, uh, most consumers want a clear liquid. Personally, if I see wood chips, I'm thrilled. 
I, I think, oh, that is so cool. That doesn't happen very often, right? Um, as, uh, same thing with a murky color. People think murky is bad and it, and it isn't necessarily, I mean, sure it could be, but nine times out of 10, it isn't. It's just, um, it's just a very interesting way, a very interesting decision by the distiller to bottle it, you know, with that look. Uh, you mentioned something else, uh, Franca, about, um, I say Cuba, I, I know it's probably Cuba. Um, you and I are in a, in a unique position because uh, people in the United States, they can't get their hands on very many Cuban products or any, I, I, think, it's, I think it's still contraband. I, I, I could be wrong. Are, are Cuban pro products allowed for market in the States or no? I still, no, I, I don't think so. And, and Cubaron is, uh, so Cuba is a state owned company anyway. Um, okay. but, you know, I got that in Italy, but uh, um, yeah. For a while, some products for a while, uh, uh, but when, uh, I think a year after Trump came back in, he, they banned it again. Yeah, yeah. So in Canada, I've, I've got access to um, the Legendario, right? For instance, this is, this is, delicious rum. I love it. Um, and another one that Legendario makes that I found very interesting. Surprisingly, it's very tricky to pair with cigars and that's the Elixir. Um, I have tried pairing this with cigars. It's a 35% alcohol rum. Um, it's, it's not a thick syrupy kind of drink, but the sensation on your palate is that it's it's a thicker sensation than you get from most rums, um, but it is delicious. You just, you know, you have, I wonder if I've got, oh, ha, a few years ago, I decided to sit down and try three different uh, spirits with a cigar. And um, so, you know, I tried it with E.H. Uh, uh, e. Taylor, small batch bourbon, uh, J.P. Weiser's red letter and the Elixir. And I totally messed it up because the Alexa was just entirely too thick. And what did I use? I think I used, oh, I used a Monte Cristo Petit number two. Okay. Now, when I was writing the notes, you can imagine, I've got three spirits in front of me. I'm smoking this Monte Cristo. There's a lot of things that are happening. You know, people say, you know, what cigar should I pair with this? And, I'm, and after doing this little exercise, I'm very cautious what I say. Because at each third of the cigar, I was getting different impressions and and from each of the beverages for each third it was it was multiplying the differences in impressions so i'm taking all these notes and you know i print this off and and when i looked at it i thought three pages of eight and a half by eleven who's going to read this you know like and and this had pictures and i was thinking oh don't ever do that again because you know who's going to read it it's just it's too much too many words but it was a very interesting experiment. And like I say, by the end of something like that, I'm pretty much blottoed because you're, you're taking in a lot of different liquids. But I would say waste a day and a half because it's such a fun experiment. You will learn so much about yourself. You will learn so much about spirits and you will learn so much about cigars. I, I did it twice. And like I say, it just, it killed me for a couple of days after because it's, it's a lot of alcohol consumption, but I wasn't drinking, I was learning. It was, you know, all for the sake of education. Um, through it all, each time I included a Canadian whiskey. I gotta admit, Canadian whiskey gives rum a run for its money when it comes to pairing with cigars. It really, really does. Canadian whiskey typically has a sweetness, just like rum does. The nice thing is when it comes to rum, it's pretty tough to find a sipping rum that's pretty high in alcohol. Whereas Canadian whiskey, you can actually kind of get that job done a little bit, 43, 47%. Um, so I like the body that the higher alcohol gives. Um, but getting back to the Cuban rums, um, for our international listeners, um, I was lucky enough to get uh, eight of the 2000s. My daughter gave me this as a gift. And these are a fascinating cigar that would go very, very well with um, this nine year Legendario. The other thing that I liked about what Legendario did is they came out with a little um, spec sheet. And, you know, normally they give us, you know, the tasting notes, the aroma notes, blah, blah, blah. But what I really, really liked about this one is 
they talked about pairing with food. And I think more rum manufacturers need to consider pairing with food. Not everybody wants wine with their food. Rum is a great pair, like they say, with fresh fish that's simply bronzed in the frying pan. Keep that in mind. Fish is very, very hard to pair when it comes to wine. Um, Pinot Noir works with salmon, and then after that, it kind of falls off. So don't use wine if you're having fish. Go to a nice, you know, more of an age sipping rum and have that as, as you know, the pairing for your meal. And that's something that I hadn't thought about. And I think I wish more rum manufacturers would do that. I wish more of them would talk about um, what, you know, what foods pair with their rums, because I think, I think um, pairing food with spirits is, is an underrepresented category in the market. Awesome. Questions? So guys, uh, we don't want it to make it a dialogue between Valerie and myself, right? Don't you have any questions on rum? Such a great thing. You're doing such a good job, Franca. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's great. She, she definitely, I'm so thankful because you're sharing so much great um, knowledge. There was a rum I tried um, a while back and it was only available, I think, in Rhode Island. Um, and uh, apparently the, the Rhode Island was once like the rum capital of the world back in like the 1600s or so. Um, did, did they, and then, and some, some rums they made from maple syrup? Oh, that's a new one to me. And I'm Canadian. I mean, Canada is kind of one of the, the maple syrup capitals of the world, right? Um, but I'll, I'll investigate that. Tell me about it. it that sounds interesting. Yeah, the rum itself, this rum, I don't think it was maybe. I just heard that there were some when I was up there. Um, this rum was, a, a, it was a, an old, supposedly an old pirate recipe uh, from, from that time period. And they had, somebody had discovered it, the recipe, was, they brought it back about 40 years ago or something. And it's only available in Rhode Island. And it was, it was, yeah, it, some, it wasn't a famous pirate's name, but maybe famous for Rhode Island. <laughs> But it was really good. I really enjoyed it. It was really flavorful. Yeah, when when you can find those gems, you know, you, you kind of wish that you, you bought a case because yeah, you, you only have like one bottle in the shop, so I would grab the last one, you know. Good for you. Good for you. Um, and, and it's and it's fun to share that information. That's why I always preface these classes with I live in a community. You've got two hundred people here. We only just got privatized liquor stores like in the last, I don't know, maybe five years. Prior to that, it was government and, and government is only interested in margins. They're not interested in different. <laughs> and you know, what you just described is very different and gee, I wish you'd saved me a, a sample. <laughs> I would have loved to have tried that. But yeah, wherever there's sugar, there's going to be rum. You know, any kind of a sugar, but, uh, but I'll, I'll keep my eye open. If I find one, I'll let you know. When, if I find anything from maple syrup. When, the one I was talking about was Thomas Tew, T-E-W. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I've, I've not heard of that one. But like you say, there was one bottle on the East Coast. But, and you're absolutely right. Um, I guess I, yeah, I mentioned that like at the beginning is that rum really could be considered North America's first distilled spirit because it goes back to like the 1600s and there was distilleries all along the Eastern seaboard making rum. Uh, and I mean, it makes sense because uh, the, the, the quickest way and the only way to travel was by ship. <laughs> and so, you know, that Eastern seaboard had a, had a great deal of influence. Hello, Valerie. Hi. Hello, Franca. Um, <laughs> I just idea. have one question. Uh, following on your on your on your comment about pairing uh, food with, with rum, right. uh, I'd like I'd like to ask you a question, which would be: uh, How would you pair the, the the rum with food? Would it be neat? Would it be in a cocktail? Because, for example, me, I have a, I have a lot of issues pairing, let's say, whiskeys or rums neat because they're quite strong and I tend to have big sips. So uh, 
I tend to get uh, knocked out before I even finish the cigar or even finish the glass of, of rum. So the question is, uh, you advise to pay cigars with rum neat, and even if we pay with cocktails, are we losing the essence of the rum? What is your opinion on that? Uh, there's a couple of things when it comes to cocktails. You're absolutely right. You're gonna you're gonna lose some of the essence of the rum by making it into a cocktail, um, because quite often what you're mixing it with has has a stronger identity. Like pineapple juice, it, that's a very strong identity juice. As soon as they say pineapple, you know you're tasting it in your head. Um, so what I what I'll do if I've you know, if I've got a glass of rum and I want to make this dram last an entire meal, I take, I, I, I remind myself, no matter how much I love it, to take small sips. And I will also swish it around in my mouth. That buys time, right? That does two things. It buys you time by swishing it around your mouth. It also activates your saliva. So you're helping to, you know, add a little bit of water to your pour to you know what you put into your mouth and then when you swallow it the beauty of that by swishing it around you're letting it um kind of do a dance in your mouth and then when you swallow it the aromas really lift through the olfactory and and you can you can catch extra aromas through through the nasal cavity and it gives you a chance to stop and think because you, you will notice the aromas lifting and you'll say, hmm, what am I getting? You know, what kind of fruits? Are they tropical fruits? Am I getting any berry fruits? So you can slow yourself down a little bit by, by being you know, conscious, by being aware of what's happening on your palate, even if you're drinking it neat. Uh, if you do add ice, you're going to, um, you're going to numb your taste buds. Uh, the ice will melt, so you're automatically adding water to the spirit um but but my my advice would be swish it around and 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 think about what's happening while you're swishing it around thinking about what's happening when you swallow it with wine uh, you know if i'm if i'm trying to test the acidity of wine i think i mentioned this in the last one i count the number of times i salivate how many times i swallow after i i you know um, after that initial swallow line, if you can get to, you know, five salivation cycles where you swallow, that's great acidity. And so, you know, typically that also means it's a wine that's meant for aging. So that means it's probably got body, it's got complexity. And the same thing with the spirit. You want to see, is it complex? The only way you're going to do that is by giving it a lot of time on your palate and giving it a chance to, to get those aromas to release, just like on a retrohale, get that retrohale and then you might learn more from it. Um, one thing I do want to mention when it comes to cocktails, one of my favorite uh, rums is actually the Ray and Nephew. This guy's at 63% alcohol. It is diesel. This by itself is like gasoline. I'm not going to deny that. But what I've learned by accident, because I like experimenting, Canada is popular for Caesars. We're, we're, we, we drink a lot of Caesars. Typically, Caesars are vodka and Clamato juice. Uh, with a with a celery stick but my favorite Caesar hands down is made with Ray and Nephew overproof rum because what happens I, I don't know I, I'd love I wish there was a scientist to help me out with this one somehow the interaction when you bring these two together this tastes delicious it, it's fantastic and you don't get you don't get those um, diesel like aromas and it's very easy on the palate so you know, this cocktail would work very, very well. And I, I extend it. I'm always looking for ways to add iron to my diet. So I will, um, um, when it comes to um, additions to a Caesar, because some people make a meal out of Caesars, I'll, um, I'll add clams. I'll chop up clams and add it and mince them up really, really small so that you get a little bit of, you know, the clam meat with the Clamato juice. So you've got a meal in a glass. But yeah, take, take your time with rum, you know, take your time, just like you take your time, you know, when you're smoking a cigar, you put the cigar down for a little while, you think about what's going on, take your time with it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks for asking the question. Are there any other question? You're being so exhaustive, Valerie. <laughs> well, I, you know, I love wine. I love spirits. You know, I've got my little collection of cigars here. Um, you know, the, the Drew Estate League of Nevada number nine I love. I love that um, we, we can have little firecrackers. I've got the Perdomo and uh, the Micarita by uh, Dumbarton. These, these are all great cigars to have with rum, uh, depending on, you know, the country. I love, love, love principal cigars, um, particularly if I'm looking at um, having a rum from the Dominican Republic. But there are so many options in rum. Uh, I hope I've helped with a little bit of the flavors and a little bit of the understanding what you're going to be getting from the different rums. And, you know, I, I hope we can do another session because one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, what pairs with the cigar and why will it work? Um, and, and to understand that, you have to understand, like, how was that spirit aged? Was it in a French cask? Was it in a, a bourbon cask? Um, and I mean, like I say, it's Bourbon Heritage Month. Every spirit around the world owes a debt of gratitude to the person who put that law in place that bourbon casks can only be used once because that allowed for a lot of, you know, American oak casks to be, to be distributed worldwide. And, and we're benefiting from it now because oak smooths, smooths everything down. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, there would be so many uh, other topics we could cover, but also indeed um, where to pay attention to when we want to design our own pairings. Uh, that's a great topic indeed. Does anybody else um, have any suggestions for other topics that we could cover? Of course, we have ideas, but we'd like to know from you. You can also email me, of course. Um, yeah, and when it is about pairing, of course, uh, there's always this notion of personal preferences. Yeah, so that's why we have a nice search uh, feature in Cigar Sense that really helps you. You start from the cigar, um, and you know, you you really are looking at the particular taste. Like, do I want something? creamy, something sweet, something savory. And then based on that, and based on what you know of the spirit, you can much more easily pair and have a better experience, even if it's the first time you smoke the cigar. So yeah, the personal preference always plays a big role, but uh, knowing the spirits and the products that we pair the cigars with is also very important. Yeah. Okay, so um, if there's no other question or other comment, Valerie, just one quick question. Uh, oh, hi, earlier, right. earlier you showed some uh, the X rum. I just want to know where is it? Where is it from? Okay, that this? X marks the spot. Yeah. This guy? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hang on. Um, I think this is. Did I see Barbados? Hang on. Now I don't. Now I don't see, and I got. I got talking. You find it in your market? And yeah, I got it in my market. Oh yeah, Barbados right here. It is it right. a Barbados rum. Barbados. It's a very yeah, it's a very heavy bottle. And like I say, this one in my market, they can't keep it in stock. It comes in okay. and it flies out the door. And it's like sixty dollars. You say so, it's thirty five percent, so is I think it's quite an easy drink, you know. That's a super easy drink for go. sure. Yeah. Sure. And, and their website, like I say, these people are salespeople. Okay. They really know how to put a website together. <laughs> Bumbu, is it called Bumbu? Uh, B-U-M-B-U, Bumbu. Ah, Bumbu, yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. Right. Thank you. Sure. You have to take note. That's what you could drink with the meal. <laughs> sure, definitely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll seek it. <laughs> Good. Um, we have a Mark. Do you want to ask your question directly? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Hi. Yeah, I uh, unfortunately missed some of this. So if you've gone over uh, this previously, feel free to uh, skip me. But um, a lot of rum drinks, cocktails in particular, get 
some pretty heavy spicing. Um, and so I think an interesting topic would be either for the future or for a conversation here specifically to rum would be uh, spices that are strongly flavored and how they might overwhelm or underwhelm or pair with cigars and especially uh, hot spices. I know there's, there's the term spice can fit a whole variety of things, but right now yes. I'm, I'm also thinking about heat <clears throat> and different kinds of, uh, you know, strongly spiced drinks and uh, foods. I think would be a really interesting conversation for maybe what countries, what kinds of tobaccos, uh, what extent of fermentation, what strengths go well from a cigar with, you know, at least family of spices, perhaps. You know, Mark, did you follow uh, Constantine's session of uh, two weeks ago? Yes. I, I'm not sure if he would agree with me, but my intuitive answer to, to, to this is, the more you eat spicy, the more you drink hot as you defined it, the more you numb your receptors. So at the end, the cigar doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you can smoke whatever. <laughs> you, well, I, that's the case when you smoke the brand and the packaging rather than the actual cigar. Right. <laughs> well, I have, a, I have a whole crew of people who really love the food and the cigar tends to be secondary to that. And so, you know, barbecues or spicy uh, drinks, there's a lot of uh, Asian uh, influences in, in my group. I've spent a lot of time in Asia and all of that. And so trying to get those people turned on to the finer nuances of cigars has been a real challenge. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yes, I don't know. I, I have not been successful with separating them and saying, you know, let's let's have a cigar before we have food. Yeah. Before yeah. we, you know, mess up our palates and try something more delicate or whatnot. Um, so that's part of my part of my uh, my curiosity here is how to get to those people. Yeah, no, and it's very interesting because you cannot easily change those tastes that are really so much eradicated into the culture. Yeah, it's very interesting. But um, I'm curious to hear what Valerie thinks about this. You know, luckily we've got Cigar Sense because it is, it is a vast library of documented tasting notes. Um, mm that the assessors have been able to, um, uh, you know, ex extract from smoking cigars. And I know in my own experience as an assessor, and I'm smoking the cigars blind, so, the, so there's no influence. Do I like the producer or don't I like the producer? Has the producer been kind and generous to me? You know, that, that does tend to come into play. Um, but because we're smoking the cigars blind, there, there has been many, many times where I have been very surprised at, at the descriptors that I've gotten out of a cigar. And not only that, you know, you're talking about the spiciness. Um, there are some cigars that really create salivation in, in your mouth while you're smoking them. Not all of them, but I, I started to measure... And I, and I mean, you know what, let me, let me back this up because I don't want to gross you out, but I almost always have a spit cup with me, okay? So that if I'm, if I'm tasting something and either I don't want to drink a lot or I take a sip. I can just quietly, very discreetly put it into my spit cup. And because I have a dedication to a spit cup, and, and it's a horrible word, but we're gonna, or term, we're gonna keep it. <laughs> I was, I, it actually came in handy because I was smoking, um, you know, a cigar sense, you know, cigar blind, and I was shocked at how much salivation was going on. And so I started to measure my salivation and I got a full ounce of salivation. From, and it's only happened once from one cigar. So 
when you're talking spiciness, that might be the cigar you want to smoke because it's, mm. it's getting the salivation going, right? And that salivation can make a difference in the spiciness or, or whatever's going on on your palate with the food or the beverage. So, you know, we do have a library of tasting notes and, you know, we can look at that stuff critically, you know, use critical thinking to, to bring together a second library of, okay, because this cigar has these characteristics, there's a very good chance that'll work with, you know, either spicy food or sweet food or, you know, whatever kind of food you want. I don't know, Franca, how big a job is that? <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for, for, for bringing this up. Indeed, we do help uh, people find the cigars. So we, we just talk about the cigars, find the cigars that they will like. Um, and what I mentioned earlier is the search that actually helps uh, based on certain descriptors to more easily pair cigars with other products. Now, going back to Mark question, Mark question um, which I still believe is a very interesting one. Um, it's true, there is this um, sensory um, uh, conformity that gets created. The more you eat spicy food, the less you will be sensitive, so your threshold changes. It's not just the thing that, you know, you wake up the next day, you have eaten spicy the previous day and you're eating spicy today and, you know, and nothing changes. Your palate adjusts to that. And if I understand correctly, your question is, so for a palate that has a specific threshold that is really not so sensitive to these very spicy foods and, uh, and sensations in the drinks, what are the best uh, cigars? I still don't think that um, other than with the strength, you should match those. It really depends again on the personal preference um, and on the other characteristics that are not the spiciness, not the, and not the, um, the, the hot, the temperature, uh, the, 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 the sensation of the temperature uh, when smoking the cigar that uh, might tell, but maybe you want to pair with based on uh, tastes and aromas. And we go back to, you know, how useful cigar scents could be there. Absolutely. Well, I think that's, that would be uh, a really terrific uh, added dimension for my exploring cigar scents. I mean, I, a lot of the people that I'm uh, trying to bring cigar culture to are food people, chefs and all of that. And so um, while the uh, Asia specialists are tend to be more into spice in the sense of uh, heat, um, there's a, a whole cohort of people who just like heavy flavors. So spice right. has to do with strength of flavors and you know, mixtures of different kinds of things. And so it's really easy when dealing with uh, the barbecue folk. <laughs> Tends to be uh, a lot easier uh, to, to work with. But I think um, developing a, a kind of more of a focus on the spices in the flavor wheel as, uh, I don't know, maybe kind of bracket off a different territory of our experience and our sensing that's focused more on these uh, food spicing combinations might give us a, a different insight into the cocktail culture as well. So I, I'm excited to explore that. Yeah, so, you know, um, uh, I see that people sometimes make... Um, uh, talk about spicy uh, when they talk about aromas, spice aromas. Right. I right. guess you, you, you know what I mean here. And, but just to clarify, you know, to whoever else listens and, you know, sometimes actually it's, it's even difficult sometimes to distinguish spiciness from the nicotine strength. Right. Um, but when we talk about spices and aromas of spices, then we talk about 
uh, even pepper is one of them, right? Because a cigar can have the aroma of pepper, but not be spicy. So it, yeah, it, it gets very, very complex. But yeah, I do agree with you that there's a part of the aroma wheel that is fully dedicated to spices. And you can go from cinnamon to vanilla, to, which is not sweet, uh, and, uh, and, and um, cardamom, and uh, you name it. You go, you open your pantry, and you smell, and that's how you, you know, <laughs> develop that kind of, um, uh, in, in one way, that type of connection with the, with the mind that helps us name them when we smell them. And yeah, and that's a very fascinating topic. Yeah. Now, I, I know, um, like he just said, there's a lot of folks that like to um, pair their cigars and their spirits with food. I know one manufacturer that they do it pretty well. I don't know about others, but uh, Davidoff has the chef's edition, um, you know, where they have uh, renowned chefs that have joined their panel and in, in, in creating cigars um, for uh, the people that are into eating with the spirit. So I don't know if there's a lot of manufacturers doing it. I know of Davidoff, they do it pretty well. But I think, like you said, it's a fascinating topic um, because there are a lot of people that want to, that are, are, are food people that like to pair uh, their spirits with their cigars. So I, I think it would be a, a nice topic. I know Cigar Sense does a great job with that. But Davidoff's really the only one that I know of that, that really includes chefs and their process when it comes to food and, and, and drink pairings. Is, is there any other manufacturer that you know of that does such a thing? Um, I, and I'm I'm very feel free to chime in or anybody else. Um, no, actually with uh, regards to food, that's the only one I know myself. There's a lot of manufacturers that create cigars that pairs particularly with beer, um, with or with with rum, with certain actually brands of beer and rum, I've I've heard. Um, so I don't know scientifically what the base for that is. That would be very interesting to to understand. Maybe we can invite some of these manufacturers to explain to us what's the rational, the objective rational, other than marketing, of course, behind that. That would be very interesting and perhaps a bit challenging of them because my experience of it and I kind of delve fairly deeply into it is that it's primarily marketing and they do some simple uh, kind of cask finishing of tobaccos and that's becoming more of a thing now. Um, but very rarely is the cigar created to actually pair with a spirit um, and it's funny because a lot of the food people would be, uh, they kind of have in their minds that if they're going to enjoy a cigar, it's going to be after the meal and with a spirit. And so a lot of the, uh, pairing suggestions kind of have to take the food off the table and talk about, you know, that specific pairing after the fact, but your palate is already so informed by this, you know, chef's meal <laughs> that has been wonderful. And um, so it would be a really interesting place to dovetail to bring the connoisseurship of these various uh, territories together. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, people who are open to the idea um, whether they're willing to open their restaurants to have uh, sort of cigar experiences at the end is a whole other story. In New York City, it's pretty much impossible. Um, there have been a few that have been open to it, but uh, ultimately, I'd love to find a place that actually, more than a steakhouse, takes that whole you know, multi-course experience uh, more seriously ending with the, the tobacco experience and the spirit. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll open that place someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. 
Okay, so I thought, I think, I really think this was very, very interesting. Thank you very much, Valerie. Thank, uh, thanks to everyone who has been here and anybody else who also uh, will watch this because it's going to go on YouTube and I'll send out the link to it um, uh, soon. Um, I think I'll make a podcast episode as well for people who prefer to just listen. And uh, I will reconnect with you with news on the next session. And uh, wish you a great weekend. Thanks, Valerie, Thank for your you. time. It was Thank very you. Impactful. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Valerie. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Terrific. Bye. Thank you. Bye.